Welcome to The Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Listen to Joe tackle the really tough moral issues, current events, and politics from a Catholic perspective. Now here's Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Hello again, Sixpack family. Welcome back to The Cantankerous Catholic, episode 99. We have yet another interview with an exceptionally fine priest this week who just happens to hold the distinction of being a former major in the United States Air Force. His name is Father Michael O'Connor, and you'll meet him in just a moment. Have you heard? A brand new translation of the Holy Bible is available for Catholics. Introducing the English Standard Version Catholic Edition, the most beautiful and readable Catholic translation of the Bible. If you've ever had difficulty reading the Bible or are looking for the perfect gift this holiday season, this is the Bible for you. The new translation includes changes to nearly 60,000 words from the Revised Standard Version and is the best combination of a literal translation written in smooth and readable English. Available in bonded leather, hardcover or softcover, the ESV Catholic Edition is a Bible you will love and a translation you can trust. To learn more about the ESV Catholic Edition or to purchase your copy, visit catholicbible.org. Again, that's www.catholicbible.org. I have to tell you that I'd planned to air this interview next week for our 100th episode because I thought it might make a great anniversary episode, but I'm airing it this week because something's come up. As we all know, there are a number of our bishops who are Marxists, despite that they claim to be Catholic. Well, there's one bishop being protested publicly by his own flock, very clearly calling him a communist. We'll tell you that story next week. Before we hear from Father O'Connor, I need to mention one more thing. On December 2nd, the Cantankerous Catholic will air its 100th episode, That makes it our birthday, but you're the one getting the gifts. You'll get the opportunity to register for a drawing that we'll do on December 2nd, then announce the first place winner in episode 101 on December 9th. This is our way of saying thanks for being a loyal listener to the Cantankerous Catholic. We're giving away a lot of prizes. The first prize is a complete digital version of the 1913 edition of the Catholic Encyclopedia, consisting of 16 volumes and valued at $3,200. Once you do a little research, you'll find that this is an incredible prize. We have 25 second prizes, a digital book collection consisting of 40 of the works of G.K. Chesterton, valued at $550. Chesterton was so great a Catholic writer of the early 20th century that there are still Chesterton literary clubs throughout the world. In fact, I just met a member the other day. Finally, we have 53rd Prizes, a digital book collection of 27 volumes of the works of St. John Henry Cardinal Newman, perhaps the greatest defender of the Catholic faith in the English-speaking world in the 19th century. This collection is valued at over $300. Also, 10 lucky winners will get a hard copy of the New Augustan Bible from our friends at the Augustan Institute in the English Standard Version. This is the easiest to read version on the market, and it's one that's become my default version. All you have to do to register is click the drawing link in the show notes for this episode and fill out the form that pops up in your browser. You can find it either by clicking the show notes button in the podcast player or visit this episode at cantankerouscatholic.com. You'll find the link in the resources section. The deadline for registration is 5 p.m. Central Time on December 2nd. Sign up today and let me thank you for being a loyal listener. Now for Father O'Connor. Father Michael O'Connor is a native of Ocean Springs, Mississippi, and the youngest of five children. He graduated from Ocean Springs High School in 1983, and in 1987 he graduated from the University of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg, where he received his bachelor's degree in psychology. 
Upon graduation, he was commissioned into the United States Air Force as a second lieutenant. He served as a military officer, both on active duty and in the Mississippi Air National Guard, principally in radar operations, surveillance, and air weapons control. Father O'Connor attained the rank of major and worked full-time for the Mississippi Air Guard from 1990 until he answered the call to the ministry in the year 2000. If you know anything about the Air Force, that's quite an advancement in rank in such a short period of time. He attended Notre Dame Seminary in New Orleans and was ordained a priest on June 11, 2005. In 2014, he was appointed pastor of Our Lady of the Gulf Parish in Bay St. Louis and briefly served as administrator of St. Anne Parish in Lausanne. In addition to parish ministry, he's done a number of parish missions and religious pilgrimages. Oh, and he enjoys fishing, a man after my own heart. Now let's get to know Father O'Connor and hear what he has to say. Father, we're thrilled to have you on the Cantankerous Catholic. Don't worry, you're among friends. We just want to expose our six-pack family to good, courageous priests who say and teach the things the laity need to hear, the things most priests are afraid to say. So welcome. Thank you, Joe. It's a, it's a privilege to be here with you. Well, good. The first, I, I appreciate that. The very first thing I want to do here is thank you for your military service and uh, you know yet <laughs> i served also but i found out that only less than one percent of americans do that so it puts us in a pretty exclusive group <laughs> yes sir okay yeah. let, let's go ahead and uh, get started before we have any real questions I want you to help the six-pack family get to know and understand you better. Will you please tell my family about your journey to the priesthood? I'll bet it's a doozy. It it is, in fact, yes. And, you know, that question, why do you want to be a priest or why would you want to be a priest, uh, has been asked to me many times. And, and, you know, and there is a short answer. And the short answer to that is for the love of God, for the salvation of souls. Amen. Uh, that that, you know, really. And, and if a man becomes a priest and isn't interested in the salvation of souls, it just boggles my mind what what would what would draw him to the priesthood. So for the salvation of souls, uh, now my journey to the priesthood, cradle Catholic uh, and uh, nominal, you know, church Sunday Catholic. But I think like many people. I went through a period in my life where I kind of maybe even felt like I was doing God a favor by going to mass. You know, he owed me. Um, Mm -hmm. And and that sort of, you know, obligation relationship. And in the course of my life, as in most every life, some difficult things happen, some challenges in my family, some personal challenges. And I remember one day, and, and there's a long story here. And actually, I, I do have a uh, a talk on my um, pod apostle called Called to Christ. And it's in about an hour long kind of discussion of the vocations call. But at one point in my life, in the military service, I was in South America. And my attitude when I was in South America on this particular occasion was one of a bit of self-pity. And I'm just telling you kind of a, a one a very clear moment of change in my life that happened, not like a thunderbolt, but certainly a, a moment of transformation. So I stood there in South America feeling sorry for myself because I had a bit of a broken heart and my military career wasn't turning out exactly the way I wanted it to. And I had this and that and I had a long litany of reasons I should feel sorry for myself. Now, <laughs> I'm standing there on this kind of raised wooden platform looking over the Constantina wire at our burn pile that we had. And in the burn pile was all of the refuse that we had thrown away over the week. And we also, believe it or not, we didn't have a a septic system there. So we would put our waste, our human waste, into these biohazard bags and throw it on the burn pile as well. 
And every so often we would just put, pour some diesel on it and burn it. And so I'm standing there on this one particular day and I looked across the compound and I saw people, a family, in the midst of our burn pile going through the things trying to retrieve something oh that word. we were throwing away. And, and there was a moment, really, where I stood there and it just became so clear to me that I had focused a lot of my life energy on the things that I didn't have. And I had focused very little energy on gratitude for the many things that I did have. And that moment of clarity, that moment of gratitude, that conversation with God. And the voice of God to me in that moment was essentially calling out the fact that I was spoiled and that I was ungrateful and that uh, I uh, was blind. And, and really, I think in that moment, you know, the whole mass, the mass has several movements and several um, components, uh, you know, of, of, uh, of repentance and of uh, a catechesis and teaching of of transformation of thanksgiving and reparation. Well, in that moment, I had a profound prayer of gratitude uh, to God, and it really did start me on a journey that uh, ultimately led to reading, growing in my faith, praying, going to confession. Uh, and, uh, and, and several years later, uh, the, the priesthood, but it's a long story. I could write a book. I really could. (laughs) (laughs) And I think you should father. (laughs) Yeah. But, uh, but at the end of the day, the short answer is because I I love God and I want others to love God and I, I desire the salvation of souls and my own soul. Right. Father, that's in fact, that's very inspiring. The, my six-pack family, I, I assure you that I'm going to get some comments on this. That's yeah. very good. Father, when you were in the military, I'm sure the noise level for patriotism was a wee bit higher than in the civilian world. I know it was when I was in. Yeah. As Catholics, our patriotism not only includes love of country, but also love of the church. Well, we, when we had Bishop Strickland on recently, he said there are two documents that every Catholic must be familiar with, intimately so, and that's the Catechism of the Catholic Church and the Constitution. I would add to that the Bible, because Catholics are notoriously bad about not reading the Bible. So what would you say about this? Well, from the standpoint of being familiar with our Constitution and the Catechism, and the sacred scripture, how could, absolutely, positively. You know, I I oftentimes tell people that the Constitution, the Constitution recognizes that it rests on the natural law. The Constitution is man-made law, but even the, the framers of the Constitution recognize that there is a law beyond the Constitution. The Ten Commandments is a is a kind of broad stroke revelation of God's law. And all law has to rest on this rock. Uh, And when we as a society decide that we're going to be the author of all law, you know, it is not gonna go well. And that's really what's happening now. This, you know, the, the, the hope and the prayer that we can be originalists when it comes to the Constitution, as to bo- as opposed to believing that the Constitution is its own animal and it's just going to change with our whims, you know, that's not good. But the Constitution rests on the foundation of the natural law. The natural law is revealed to us in and through the sacred scripture. And the Catechism, 5,000 times it quotes sacred scripture. and uh, And so it is a kind of handbook of tradition for us. And uh, Pope Benedict said that, you know, the tradition of the church is how have we always understood the sacred scripture? You know, um, it's, right. it, it, it is one with, if you will, one source of revelation, the scripture and the tradition. Uh, and so right. nonetheless, I agree. 
I totally agree. And and as far as patriotism goes, I don't want to go too long on the one question, but as far as patriotism goes, I heard, uh, you know, the word patriot comes from pater. And I, I yes. explained this in that homily uh, that uh, got me the most notoriety about, um, you know, uh, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Um, and patriotism is that we honor our father and our father, our mother, you know, holy mother, the church, our fatherland, our motherland. And so that loyalty to family and to country is, yes, it's written into the natural law. It is. Yes, and I'm glad you brought up natural law regarding the Constitution, Father. You know, one thing I frequently tell people is that if they will carefully read the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, uh, the first 10 amendments of the Constitution, that document could have been written by nearly all of our popes. Nearly all divine law has as its basis natural law. Uh, it's just that God elevated some parts of natural law. And good grief, why not? He's the one who gave us natural law. Exactly so, right. And all for our good. All to point us yeah. in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's move on to the next question, Father. You know, I've been in lay evangelization for over 30 years, and the Holy Spirit's used me to make hundreds of converts. In fact, I've got 84 adult godchildren. Uh, yet about six years ago, God shifted my evangelistic efforts from lapsed and non-Catholics to Catholics in the pew. The last thing I want to do is offend the six-pack family, but facts are facts. At least 95% of Catholics don't have any idea what the church teaches, despite that most of them think they do. This is obviously true because an EWTN survey shows that at least 82% of Catholics reject one or more of the constant 2,000-year teachings of the Catholic Church. Obviously, you recognize that this problem exists because I watched your video you did on the sacrament of penance in your parish. How do you think we can overcome the catechetical ignorance of the laity? Wow, how can we? Um, <laughs> I'll give you a, a little tiny preview of something that I'm going to talk about, uh, starting to work on my homily for this Sunday. And, you know, when a person doesn't know that they have cancer, they're not interested in getting chemotherapy. You know, who wants chemotherapy when they when they don't know they're sick? OK, but when a person becomes aware of the fact that they gotten this terrible disease and that this is going to affect them in this way and then then they're eager for it, even if it, there's a, some difficulty involved well the sin that or the the disease that we have as a culture and as individuals is sin and i think when people become aware of the spiritual battle that they're in and that their children are in and that their grandchildren are in then they're going to want to be educated. We uh, are my bishop here in the Diocese of Biloxi has been very kind of eager to get us onto this path of what he calls and what others have called intentional discipleship. And one of the things that I learned in this intentional discipleship movement is that there is these stages of of faith development. And, you know, you go, uh, it starts with that you have to trust somebody and God, how we have undermined people's trust uh, as a church. But uh, you have to trust somebody. You have to trust something. And then from trust, you build to kind of a, a curiosity. And this curiosity becomes this real seeking. And what we have is we're trying to pour we're trying to catechize people that very often aren't seeking, aren't even curious about the faith. So kind of recognizing where people are in their spiritual journey and bringing them along from that place. Uh, in our own confirmation program here, if you look at the statistics of the number of people that leave the church or young people after they're confirmed that don't come back or quit practicing the faith, at least for a time, it is overwhelming. It's a it is like 
80 percent or so. And that might even be higher than that. And so what we've tried to do is have this process that builds them to where they have some desire instead of being catechized as a here, you must learn this. Let me beat this into your head is that process of conversion. You know, Joe, in your own life, I'm sure you can look back and see where someone was trying to teach you to where you became an eager learner and you want it to be taught and want it to grow. So I think True. ultimately, end of the day, it's conversion, conversion, conversion. When you convert somebody, when you have them turn from away from God, they have an experience of metanoia, like I was telling you about standing there in the jungle of South America and had that moment of metanoia. And it's like, OK, I want to learn my faith. I want to see what I need to be grateful for. I, so that experience, you know, that come to Jesus moment that we have got to bring people to. We've got to catechize them. And again, the whole spiritual battle that I think when their eyes are open to that and you're either with me or you're against me then people are going to want to want to be catechized. And we just haven't done that. We haven't given them any reason to want to know the faith. And uh, that that that's true. You know, Father, one thing I learned, first of all, I'm a convert myself. Uh, I became a convert, well, almost 33 years ago. So I chose this. Unlike yes. most Catholics, they're born into it. Yes, sir. And one thing I learned very early on, the way I've evangelized has always been by teaching the catechism evangelistically. And in order to do that, you've got to do the one thing that I've never seen catechesis in a parish do. You not only teach what the church believes, but you teach why the church yes. believes it and why it's true. If you can demonstrate, especially to Americans, uh, because we're naturally suspicious anyway. So if you could, like, every aspect of the Catholic faith can be proven. I can prove the existence of God. I can prove that Jesus established the church. I can prove the Eucharist, I, uh, the, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, etc. All these things can be proven. And it's been my experience that if you show people, then they're really interested. And as far as making converts, there are always three places where in the catechism where they decide they want to become Catholic. One is whenever I teach them, I prove to them that God exists because, you know, evolution has been taught for so many years. That's what even Catholics have come to accept. And, and it, it violates science like crazy. The second place where people want to convert is whenever I teach them the ninth article of the creed. Uh, in other words, that Jesus established the Catholic church. And the third place where they make the decision is whenever I teach them about the Holy Eucharist. And, you know, I'm never surprised in the very first lesson, uh, whenever I prove the existence of God, I'm never surprised whenever they say, Hey, can I be a Catholic? <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. And, you know, not once in 30 years of doing this have I ever asked anybody if they wanted to become a Catholic. That's above my pay grade. Yeah. My job is to give them the faith or give them the truth. And it's between them and the Holy Spirit whether or not they become Catholic. You're absolutely right. We're not giving them any reason to want to learn. Right. And, uh, and and I think that's so important. I appreciate what you had to say on that, Father. Yes, sir. thank you, Joe. Uh, despite, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. But uh, your your hold the idea of 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 those three kind of experiences of moments or when people just think they want to become Catholic. Yeah, the one that I have the most uh, familiarity with is that one about the Holy Eucharist. It seems like when a person begins to be drawn by the Eucharist or by this fundamental doctrine, but also I've had people approach me and say, you know, there's only one church out there that even teaches that we're the church that was founded by Jesus Christ, you know, and that, that, so those avenues, I'm familiar with those as well, but the Eucharist is probably the most, most for me. 
Yeah, in fact, what I've found is that once they realize that there's no place beside the Catholic Church where they can find the real presence of Christ, they just have a natural desire to want to be where Jesus is. Yes. You know, despite the widespread catechetical ignorance of Catholics, faithful Catholics realize there are many things wrong in the church and that our bishops no longer have any credibility. Uh, As you'd expect, these dissatisfied and disenfranchised Catholics are looking for a place to point fingers. Most have settled on Vatican II as the culprit. What would you say to that? Well, you know, I think the Second Vatican Council came at a time in history that um, left itself ripe to uh, being misused by people who wanted the church to be different from what she what she is. You know, the the hermeneutic of continuity which is uh, uh, an expression that we heard from uh, and about uh, Pope Benedict, the hermeneutic, and that is the lens, the way of seeing things of continuity, that the, that the teachings of the Second Vatican Council or the pastoral guidance of the Second Vatican Council are in continuity with the tradition of the church. Amen. And, and that is true. But there is a school of thought out there that wants a hermeneutic or or a lens, a paradigm of rupture, like, okay, things are different now. And that 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 rebellion inside of the church has been extremely disruptive and uh, and has resulted in so much. Uh, confusion and chaos, especially in Europe and the United States, probably more so in Europe. But the occasion of the Second Vatican Council, and and I, you know, I'm not an expert on this by any means, but, you know, the first Vatican Council was called to address the church in the modern world and a couple of other things. The, The whole reality of modernity and uh, the the so-called enlightenment and what was happening in philosophy and what was happening in academia. So the first Vatican Council was called to address some of those things and to kind of give the church the tools to deal with some of that, the, the changes in the world. And, you know, it was cut short by World War I and the job wasn't finished. And by the time the Second Vatican Council was called, the, the, you know, the different, you know, you think about the Industrial Revolution. Well, what happened? What did we have in, in, the, in the 20th century? You know, we had, we had a, a technological evolution, a communications revolution. We had a medical revolution. We had all these incredibly rapid changes in the world. And the church was was trying to keep up with the culture, if you will, in the sense of being able to speak to modern man. Well, you know, when the Second Vatican Council came, it just it just exploded. I mean, just the the I think there was a great optimism and and an overly positive uh, understanding of what human nature was capable of. And, And it's just not been well. The hermeneutic of continuity has not been implemented very well. And the hermeneutic of uh, of disunity or the hermeneutic of rupture is is what has left a a trail of of destruction. But the Second Vatican Council in and of itself may have some statements that are ambiguous or some things that are, are difficult. But, uh, you know, it's not I don't think it's the source of the problem. I think concupiscence is the source of the problem. I think sin is the source of the problem. Absolutely. It always is. It's the worst pandemic we know. Yes. Uh, I frequently tell Catholics that, you know, Vatican I was a dogmatic council and Vatican II was a pastoral council. But the reason is because Vatican I was interrupted by the Italian Revolution and they never got to finish their work. And so Vatican II is really 
a completion of Vatican I, because many of the things in Vatican II, they, they reiterated Vatican I. But there don't seem to be people who are middle of the road on Vatican II. Instead, you've got one extreme that wants to go, oh, by the spirit of Vatican II. And, of course, the spirit of Vatican II is nowhere mentioned in any document. Right. Uh, and then you have people on the other extreme who don't even think Vatican II was valid. And whenever I hear them make their comments about Vatican II said or did this, Vatican II said or did that, I tell them, you are full of baloney because they're regurgitating things that other people have told them. Right. And I tell them, look, no, that's that's not right. If you really want to know what Vatican II taught, try reading it. I've read the documents of Vatican II. And, and so I wouldn't take anybody's word on what the council had to say because, you know, it's right there for you. It's easy Amen. to read. Amen. And and I think that every Catholic has a moral obligation to read the documents of Vatican II, especially if they have strong opinions one way or the other on the council. Well, if they're going to go around quoting what it said, they need to read it. Yeah. And, and again, you know, in the same way that one has to be careful about picking and choosing a line out of sacred scripture without recognizing the context and the unity of the word of God. So with church documents and, and especially something as as broad as an entire uh, ecumenical council. So that that the spirit of Vatican II has been used as a as a, a permission to do whatever you want. And and certainly that is not in the tradition of the church, and it certainly was not part of commission given by the uh, Second Vatican Council. Again, the times in which that council, you know, you think about the, the late 60s and just what was happening culturally. And uh, it doesn't surprise me that the chaos erupted in the church, I guess hindsight being 2020. It's like I sometimes ask the question, you know, as I think we all do, I, I sometimes ask the question, well, God, what, what would it be like if Vatican I would have just finished the job and we wouldn't have had a Vatican II? You know, where would we be? But those kind of questions are, you know, needless speculation because this is the world in which we live and let's go forward and let's implement the Second Vatican Council. I'm not ready to go backwards in the church. I'm ready to go forwards. I'm ready to go forward, you know, to the future. And uh, and I do think that the authentic and fruitful church will emerge from this time of chaos and closing Amen. and crisis. Uh, and, and, and it's going to you know, it's going to look more like the church of tradition than it's going to look like the church of chaos. Amen. You know, you're so right about taking things out of context. People who are kind of extreme, I, I hate to use the terms left and right whenever it comes to the church, but those who are kind of to the extreme right, they'll, there's no salvation outside the church. And Vatican II said so. Yeah, that's true. If you look at Lumen Gentium 14, but if you look at Lumen Gentium 16, it more or less says, a, it says, however, comma, for those who don't know. And, of course, you know, our separated brethren, they don't understand the history of Protestantism. Right. Uh, in fact, I've had so many of them tell me, especially whenever I did my work in Alabama, uh, I've had so many of them tell me, you know, well, like, for example, the King James Bible was good enough for Paul and Silas. It's good enough for me. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and and a, a couple of guys from the Church of Christ, they said, well, no, our church was founded by Christ. I said, no, it wasn't. It was founded by the Campbells. And, <laughs> oh, no, no, I, we can prove that it was founded by Christ. I said, all right, do that. They said, what's our name? Church of Christ. They said, well, I'm... <laughs> 
So, (laughs) you know, I could say I could say I was uh, resurrected by Christ. That doesn't mean anything. I mean, just because I said it. Right. But, uh, you know, people do take things out of context. And it's true that Vatican II in Lumen Gentium 14 said there is no salvation outside the church. Of course, they didn't say it quite in those words, but they did say that. In Vatican, I mean, sorry, Lumen Gentium 16, though, there were there there was a natural development of doctrine. Yeah, and I also, I, you know, when when even when the Book of Revelation speaks about people coming from every you know tongue, tribe, nation, you know, the hope that that God desires His children that He has created and granted. It's only through baptism that we become children in Christ. Amen. Uh, that 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 yeah, I don't want to tell God who he's allowed to save and who he's not allowed to save. What I know <laughs> is that my job is to teach, to live and to uphold the fullness of the faith and draw others to it because it is the most precious gift that anybody will ever get. I won't say I don't spend a lot of time worrying about whether or not Protestants will be saved or or people that never were evangelized will be saved. Uh, I say, let me try to evangelize as many as I can and live a life that draws others to the church. You know, amen. Amen. And that is the key right there. Setting the example. I've told many of my students over the years, the judgment day is going to be very surprising that. A lot of Catholics are going to find themselves on the wrong side of the pile, <laughs> yeah. and there are going to be a lot of Protestants that they're in heaven with. Yeah, so, and isn't it amazing that, I mean, doesn't our Lord say that over and over again? Yeah, sure he does. I mean, he really is, and and again, I don't, I mean, you know, I say to people, when, when, when I go, when the good Lord calls me, I hope these words are on my lips. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. You know? Oh, I, yeah. I don't want to be saying, show me my room. Show me my mansion. I <laughs> say, Lord, <laughs> Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And, and the other thing, you know, this Sunday, again, it's, it's going to be this, the, um, the story of the, uh, one of the episodes where Jesus talks about the talents, five, three, uh, one. And right. or five, two, one. And and you know, God knows how many talents Joe Six Pack has and how Absolutely. you're gonna be accountable for them. And God knows how many talents I have. And God knows how many talents the kid in Ethiopia that died at three years old had. And and right. he, each one of us is gonna give an accounting of the talents that he gave us. And to those that's in right. much is given, much will be asked. And and, that, and I keep that in mind, right. and 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 that helps me make sense of a world that that oftentimes doesn't make sense, you know. Yeah, I. <laughs> in fact, regarding this one, uh, one night I was kind of dozing, uh, you know, one of those sleeps where you're not quite asleep but you're not quite awake, and so dreams get real vivid. Yes, sir. And, uh, <laughs> I dream. I, I dreamed that I was there standing in my uh, ready for my judgment, and it was about, he, Jesus was about to tell me, and I, Lord, before you open your mouth, uh, I'll clean up your sandals if you give me a break. You know? <laughs> but uh, okay, anyway, that's great. I don't want to. I don't want to keep you too long today, Father. So I've got one final question for this interview. Yes, sir. If you were the only priest of God in America, and all of this nation was your parish, what would you say to your parishioners right now above anything else? Well, the basic proclamation of the gospel is that you were made by love and for love, that God, who is infinitely perfect and good in himself, created you that you would share in his life and in his love. But the disease of sin is real. And the disease of sin kills. And we have been infected by the disease of sin. But thanks be to God that Jesus Christ has come, not to condemn us for sin, but to save us from sin. 
and that Jesus offers us his life, taking on himself the punishment that is due to sin, asking nothing for himself, but giving his body, blood, soul, and divinity for our salvation while taking the punishment that is justly ours on himself. And Amen. asks us to receive that gift, to receive it freely, to receive it with an open heart, to be baptized, to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, to be sealed by the consecration of confirmation, and to receive his body, blood in the Holy Eucharist, to live our faith, and to recognize that the battle continues and that we must be nourished, strengthened, catechized, educated, and then share that gift with others, and that it's all good news, and that that is what I would want to share with them. Uh, Father, I think that's tremendous. I can tell you right about now, the six-pack family is cheering and saying, wow, we want more of this priest. Uh, in fact, Father, I'm so confident that they're going to love this interview. Would you consider coming back on the show again on, on more specific topics sometime in the future? I would. Yes, Joe, I would. Uh, and if it would be too specific, I would want to be able to maybe brush up a little bit and, and uh, maybe read a section of the catechism or something. You know? <laughs> well, don't worry. I, I, I'll give you a heads up. <laughs> okay. Okay, I won't spray questions on you like I did today. No, no, it's OK. One final thing I'd like to ask for from you, Father. Yes. Would you please give the six pack family your priestly blessing? Okay. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Father. And right, we're girl. looking forward to having you on the show again soon. Okay. Okay. Thanks okay. again. And thank you for your ministry. Thank you for your service to the nation and uh, and for this uh, for this great work of, of, of evangelization. Well, thank you very much, Father. As a veteran, it's been my experience that officers are every bit as tough as enlisted men, but just a little more refined. I've no doubt that Father O'Connor is tough, but it's apparent that this priest has an immense love for souls. I hope you enjoyed this interview. I know I did. Do you have an apostolate you'd like other Catholics to learn about? Maybe you have an e-commerce business and you want to build sales while supporting a Holy Orthodox apostolate. Whatever you want to advertise, The Cantankerous Catholic is your portal to success. The Cantankerous Catholic isn't even a year into broadcasting its weekly shows and we're already listened to in 16 countries, all 50 states, and 101 major cities throughout the U.S. and Canada. Our listener demographics are the most sought after for advertisers. The Cantankerous Catholic avatar is 53% men and 47% women ages 18 to 34. The show's average growth rate through 2019 was 24% per week, and our listeners are Orthodox Catholics who reject heterodox Catholic positions and political correctness. Relative to other podcasts and online advertising, our rates are extremely cost-effective and inexpensive. You can advertise in each show's show notes, in the recorded episode itself, our weekly newsletter that announces each new episode, all of these media together, or in any combination. So contact us today by filling out the form on the Sponsor Kit page at cantankerouscatholic.com or email Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy, directly at joe at cantankerouscatholic.com to learn how you can begin driving traffic to whatever you want to promote while helping to support a worthy, orthodox, and hard-hitting apostolate. Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy, wants to make sure you're informed about all the Catholic news you need to know. Here's Joe Sixpack's top five Catholic news picks for this episode. Catholic news pick number five. Hats off to the hill. 
Congresswoman-elect Maria Elvira Salazar, a Cuban-American from Miami, wants to form a small group of incoming Republican legislators called The Force to counter Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez's left-wing quartet known as The Squad. Included in the force would be newcomers like Nicole Maliotakis of Staten Island, New York, who has Cuban and Greek heritage, and Victoria Sparks, who fled the Soviet Union and calls on Americans to stop socialism and defend the American way. Let the fight begin! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick Pick number number four. four. Hats off to the Daily Wire. Sheriffs in upstate New York have publicly stated that they won't enforce Governor Andrew Cuomo's new executive order limiting private gatherings on Thanksgiving to 10 persons. Frankly, I'm not sure it could sustain a constitutional challenge in court for several reasons, including your house is your castle, said Fulton County Sheriff Richard Giardino. No, 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 no! You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick Pick number three. three. Hats off to Catholic News Agency. Archbishop Jose Gomez, head of the U.S. Bishops' Conference, offered both praise and criticism of Joe Biden. Archbishop Gomez praised Biden on immigration, refugees, combating racism, and climate change, but said, quote, He has also given us reason to believe that he will support policies that are against some fundamental values that we hold dear as Catholics. These policies include the repeal of the Hyde Amendment and the preservation of Roe v. Wade. Both of these policies undermine our preeminent priority of the elimination of abortion. No mention of LGBT, no mention of socialism, Gomez only supports no borders, Just another Marxist bishop. You're an idiot. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick Pick number two. two. Hats off to the Daily Wire. Retiring Ambassador Jim Jeffrey, who not only signed the infamous Never Trump letter while President Donald Trump was a candidate in 2016, but also gives foreign policy advice to Joe Biden, has admitted his team lied about the number of troops in Syria to thwart the president's agenda. This man should be charged with treason because that's exactly what it is. That's what I'm talking about. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. Catholic Catholic News News Pick Pick number number one. one. Hats off to Fox News. Black Lives Matter co-founder Patrice Cullors called for a meeting with Joe Biden to discuss campaign promises to combat police brutality. Black people won this election. We want something for our vote, she said. Here it comes. Oh, no. You can read the whole story by clicking the link in my show notes. I am hard, but I am fair. It's time for the Catholic Boot Camp with your drill sergeant, Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy. Learn the Catholic faith and how to defend it like you've never heard it before. This boot camp is tough, so there's no political correctness, no spirit of Vatican II, and no namby-pamby platitudes. Drill Sergeant Joe Sixpack, the every Catholic guy, will prepare you for spiritual war. Now here's Joe Sixpack. During a desperate battle on Guadalcanal in World War II, an American soldier threw himself on a Japanese grenade that landed among his mortar crew. The soldier survived the blast, but was horribly wounded and maimed. The chaplain visited the young man in an army hospital and asked him, Why did you take that million-to-one chance and risk your life that way? The soldier smiled and replied, It was like this, Father. I had gone to confession that morning, so I was ready to die, but I didn't know if the other guys were ready. This great American hero drives home a point about death and our need for confession, and does it quite perfectly. Death is the most rude of all visitors. 
He never announces himself, and he always comes when we least expect and are least prepared for his visit. Even if we don't go to confession regularly because we are sorry for having offended God, we should at least prepare ourselves for that most dreaded visitor, death. But Joe, you say, I'm not a bad person. Why do I need to go to confession regularly? Obviously, I can't be your conscience, but I do have a good understanding of human nature. After all, I'm a human, believe it or not. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to recognize that Catholics aren't utilizing the confessional as they should. We live in a culture where what was once viewed by polite society as wrong is today the norm. We think nothing of dressing immodestly, using artificial contraception, or even fudging on our taxes. Yet everyone goes to communion at Mass, but hardly anyone shows up for confession. All of our sins, original and actual in the case of an adult, were washed away in baptism, but that sacrament of initiation doesn't protect us from the sins committed afterward. Jesus understands human nature perfectly because he both created it and lived it, so he established the sacrament of penance so we could find reconciliation to God from the sins we commit after baptism. As we mentioned some weeks ago, all sacraments have both matter and form. The matter of penance is the penitent and his sins. What sort of matter would be considered worthy of confession? Well, just randomly poking through the written examination of conscience in front of me, I'll ask you a few of those questions and you can decide if you perhaps need to go to confession. Have you refused to believe anything the church teaches? Have you omitted your daily prayers? Have you used God's name carelessly? Have you failed to attend Mass on Sunday or Holy Day of Obligation? Have you disobeyed your parents, children, or other lawful authority, adults? Have you allowed anger to turn into resentment? Have you been intoxicated? Have you willfully entertained impure thoughts? Have you kept something you borrowed beyond the agreed-upon period or for an unreasonable time? Have you listened with pleasure to the exposure of the faults of others? Have you failed to fast or abstain when you were not excused by a sufficient reason? These are just a few of the things to ask ourselves. We should never allow shame or fear to prevent us from confessing our sins, especially mortal sins. Speaking from a purely human standpoint, I can understand how tempting it is to withhold a sin in confession. I've been tempted more than a few times myself. However, our logic and reason tells us such shame and fear are superfluous. The priest who hears our confession is acting in persona Christi, that is, the person of Christ. In other words, it's actually Christ to whom we are confessing our sins. Furthermore, the priest is bound by the seal of confession. That means he can never tell a soul, including his own confessor, anyone's confession. Indeed, many priests have been jailed, tortured, and murdered rather than divulge the contents of a penitent's confession. The seal of confession even extends to the point that a priest can't use the knowledge gained from a confession for any reason. Let me illustrate that point. Let's say that Father Patrick has appointed Judas Avarice to oversee the parish finances. One day, Judas goes to confession and tells Father he's embezzled $250,000 from parish funds. Since Judas must replace the money to satisfy God's justice, Father Patrick tells Judas he must replace the money. However, there are two things Father absolutely cannot do. He can't tell the police and have Judas prosecuted because that would violate the seal of confession. Furthermore, Father can't later replace Judas in his position because this would be acting upon knowledge gained in the confessional. The seal of confession is that strict. Now let's get back to being tempted to withhold a mortal sin in confession. If a penitent deliberately omits the confession of a mortal sin, he commits the additional mortal sin of sacrilege, risking eternal punishment. Furthermore, he leaves the confessional without having any of his sins forgiven. 
In order to be forgiven and reconciled to God, the penitent must confess the sin of sacrilege. Any communions received since the sacrilege, which is itself a sacrilege to be confessed, all the sins of his sacrilegious confession or confessions, and all the mortal sins committed since. Whew! <laughs> it's a lot easier to avoid sacrilegious confession in the first place. A little tip I learned is, when you're tempted to omit a mortal sin and confession, just tell the priest you're being tempted and the temptation will flee. Now, sometimes people simply forget to confess a mortal sin. Don't try to play games with God because he knows the truth. But if you genuinely forget to confess a mortal sin during confession, it's still okay to go to communion because God forgave the sin because you made a good confession and didn't deliberately omit the mortal sin. However, know with moral certitude that you're obligated to confess the forgotten mortal sin the next time you go to confession, which should be as soon as possible. Finally, most Catholics think the priest has to forgive your sins. Not necessarily. Jesus gave his priests the decision-making power in the confessional, and a priest may withhold absolution if the penitent shows no sign of sorrow for his mortal sins, or if he indicates he won't break with the sin. For example, a man confesses several acts of adultery because he has a mistress. The priest tells the man he has to break off the adulterous relationship. The man refuses. The priest will be within his right and doing his duty to refuse absolution. The sacrament of penance is also called reconciliation and confession. Next week, we'll take a final look at this wonderfully merciful sacrament. On December 2nd, The Cantankerous Catholic is going to air our 100th episode. That makes it our birthday, but you're the one getting the gifts. And these gifts are all Catholic and very, very big. You'll get the opportunity to register for a drawing that we'll do on December 2nd, then announce the first place winner on episode 101 on December 9th. This is our way of saying thanks for being a loyal listener to The Cantankerous Catholic. We're giving away a lot of prizes. The first prize is a complete digital version of the 1913 edition of the Catholic Encyclopedia, consisting of 16 volumes valued at $3,200. We have 50 second prizes, a digital book collection consisting of 40 of the works of G.K. Chesterton, valued at $550. Chesterton was so great a Catholic writer in the 20th century that there are still Chesterton literary clubs throughout the world. Finally, we have 25 third prizes, a digital book collection of 27 volumes of the works of St. John Henry Cardinal Newman, perhaps the greatest defender of the Catholic faith in the English-speaking world in the 19th century. This collection is valued at over $300. Even if you don't win a prize, everyone who signs up for the drawing will receive a consolation prize. All you have to do to register is click the link for the drawing in the show notes for this episode and fill out the form that pops up in your browser. The deadline for registration is 5 p.m. Central Standard Time on December 2nd. Sign up today and let me thank you for being a loyal listener. Catholic Church is 2,000 years old. A lot of wisdom is gained over two millennia. Each week we'll share some of that wisdom with a Catholic quote. So here's this week's Catholic quote. This week's Catholic quote is from St. Francis de Sales. He said, Anxiety is the greatest evil that can befall a soul except sin. God commands you to pray, but he forbids you to worry. I believe a really great way to teach the faith is through stories, parables, and anecdotes. So here's today's story. 
the members of a Greek colony in southern Italy had grown so lax in morals that their leaders couldn't stand conditions any longer. So they asked Seleucus, an honorable and highly esteemed man, to draw up laws for the guidance of the people. He did as he was asked with great diligence. To his great sorrow, the first person to break the new law was his own son. The judges condemned the lad, according to the laws laid down by his father, to have both his eyes gouged out. Zeleucus didn't think of asking for mercy for his son, but fatherly love impelled him to find some way to soften the punishment without lessening the force of law. After much thought, he offered one of his own eyes for his son. The sentence was carried out by depriving the son of the right eye and the father of his left eye. Imagine how the empty socket must have reminded the disloyal son of his crime, but also of his father's love for him. We're reminded of a greater act of love by looking at a crucifix. The sight of Jesus hanging on a cross is also a reminder of the evil of the sin that killed, not blinded, the Son of God. Every Catholic needs to be listening to the Cantankerous Catholic because this show will help you to learn to navigate through these tumultuous times as well as learn, understand, and live our Catholic faith better. You can help other Catholics find the Cantankerous Catholic much easier by leaving a review of this show at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. Reviews cause the podcasting platforms to show the Cantankerous Catholic more often. And I thank you in advance for leaving a review. This has been the Cantankerous Catholic with Joe Sixpack, the Every Catholic Guy. Thanks for subscribing, and be sure to visit cantankerouscatholic.com to get your free copy of Joe's popular book, The Best of What We Believe, Why We Believe It.